Here's the thing, guys. I gotta tell you the honest truth. Like, I'm getting frustrated. And it, it's simply because, like, I've said this before. I don't think pay to play is necessarily a problem. Like, somebody has to pay for kids to play soccer. So, like, context. You have kind of two options. You have pay to play, which is what we have in this country, where parents or somebody is fronting the cost. And then on the other side, you go to Europe or South America. Not all, but a lot of programs, clubs, teams are extremely cheap. There are some that charge you full price, full price being pay to play. Um, but a lot of them are subsidizing the cost. And that's because they use a model called compensation for formation and solidarity payments, where those organizations, what I would call take the risk and cover the cost of the player to participate. But by doing that, if they develop them to be professional players, and there's more to this than what I'm just giving you right now, but I'm just trying to explain, those clubs would then receive compensation. So example, Jude Bellingham was formed in Birmingham City's academy. He played on the first team for Birmingham City. He left the Borussia Dortmund. There was a transfer fee plus a training compensation fee. Then there was a fee when he signed for Real Madrid, the fee that I, I remember reading in an article and read or listened to, I should say, in an interview, was $6 million. Real Madrid had to pay Birmingham City for the development compensation. And, or I guess it was like a package of all this stuff, including training compensation. So like Birmingham City developed a player, he played for free, and they got rewarded for developing this player. That's how it works. So like where I'm going with this is, it's very hard in this country because clubs in general, in general, except for MLS academies, there is no benefit to them for developing a player, unless you're an MLS Academy. If you're an MLS Academy, you have a benefit because you can gain advantage of training compensation. A normal organization, a normal club that is not, not an MLS Academy cannot gain the benefit of training compensation. So a cash cow or a regular club, whatever, I'll just call it a club. <laughs> a club cannot gain the benefit of training compensation. So they have to, they don't have to, but it wouldn't make sense otherwise to not use pay to play because if if they, and I've done this before myself personally with my organization, we have subsidized the cost of kids to play, which is cool. Like it's awesome to do. But like, if you really think about it, what is the incentive that I have or any organization has to do it for free? There is no incentive because we can take a player or players, let's say it's a team, we can sponsor an entire team the parent next week could still decide, hey, I want to leave because I'm not happy or with whatever, for whatever reason, they could say, I'm not happy, I'm pulling my son. But we don't get training compensation rights for the kid. So we're helping somebody play for free out of goodwill, which I think is important. But like the average organization has no need to do that. And so they're not going to do it, one. Two, since they have no need to take players for free, they can charge people to pay, and then they have no incentive to actually develop players. Like, I think this is very misunderstood, this premise about development and why in this country in particular, there is basically no development. There is no need to do so. Nobody has a desire. There's no need. There's no benefit to it. So at the end of the day, and again, I went through the system, it's not designed to get people to the top level. You can have the badge on your shoulder that says you're supposed to with the wording and whatnot, saying that you might be the next player, but there's literally no incentive. It's all done from within. So my frustration is coming from like, again, I've said this multiple times. I do not believe that the youth soccer system, based on my experience through it, what I see on the day-to-day -day of grassroots every single day does not prepare players to get to the next level. So a great example would be this, playing time, just an example. Playing time in this country is a given, it is not earned. Like I was having a conversation with a player the other day after one of the games, he's an older player, and he's like, he said to me, hey coach, you know, I feel like I do better when I start, I lose my rhythm when I'm not in. And I said, well, do you know why you didn't start the game today? And he said, no. And I said, well, you missed Thursday and you missed Friday's practice. Is like, well, Thursday was a meeting. Yes, I know. It was a mandatory event and you chose not to go. Oh, but I didn't think it was going to be important. Well, then I didn't think it was going to be important for you to play. So like, 
people expect in pay to play, that is the trend that has been set, that regardless of skill level, because you are paying for it, you play. But like in most cases of college, for example, in college soccer, most of the time, student athletes in soccer are paying to play. You might not pay right away. You might have to take a student loan or something to be a part of the team, but you're paying for it. Not many kids are getting a full ride, either all athletically, all academically, or some sort of combination. It's not many kids. It's probably one to 2%. So like when I played college soccer, I did receive a scholarship, but I still had to pay money out of my pocket to play. And it wasn't out of my pocket. It was out of my family's pocket at the time. But the point is, somebody still had to pay for it. I didn't receive a full scholarship athletically and academically. I still had to pay a fee to play. It just, you know, we, if, if that makes sense. So it was either a loan or we paid it up front. So we're still paying to play. It's just that I guess because it's a higher level that we don't have a right to speak about it because you don't get a right to speak. So it's just, it's one of those things. It's interesting. Like, how do you build that gap? Because if the average college is going to have 40 players, 30 to 40 players on a team, only 11 can play, one, and two, the coach, I'm sorry to tell you this, but it's the fact and it's truth. The coach already knows generally who his starting 11 are, or let's say like primary 15, primary 15 could be 18, but primary 18, 15, 18 players. So kind of like starters, impact players off the bench, a mix of those. And then there's players that will make an impact as well, potentially, but not as frequently. And then he knows who his reserve players are. And it might go higher, it might be 15 to 20, right? But you can only take 18 to 20 on game day rosters. And then let's say he's got 40 guys just for easier math. Let's say he can take 20 to game day. That means half his roster is not going to games and only 18 can play. So if only 18 can play, that means two guys that are rostered aren't even gonna play. And it's like, Back to the point, how do you develop players to be ready for that level? Well, my experience and my opinion says, you have to at least start putting them on a path that treats them like the next level treats them. So coaches at the next level, again, I'll just use college as the first step. They don't care about how you feel. They don't care about anything other than the result. I mean, obviously, I think grades are important because the school is telling them, hey, you have to, the students have to have good grades or you're going to be in trouble as well. So, like, this, the coach will require you need to have good grades. Some of them care. Some of them don't care, to be honest. Um, it, it's not necessarily important. To them. But what is important to them is that you follow their rules and you do what they're telling you to do. And, and here's the thing that I think people don't get about college or professional, using college again. Their job is to win. I know it's amateur Technically, it is amateur. I mean, I know they have NIL, NI, NIL deals now and stuff, but like it's still technically amateur. And, um, but the, the thing is the coaches still have to win. Like they're being told by their athletic directors, win, build a program that can be successful because no athletic director wants to have a losing program. Nobody wants that. They might have, you know, greater emphasis on certain teams like basketball, for an example, or maybe it's soccer or maybe it's football, whatever it is but they're still being told that they have to build a winning program. So that means the coach has to win. And here's the thing, the coach is gonna have a family to feed. He's gonna have a mortgage. He's gonna have bills to pay. He doesn't wanna lose his job. He doesn't wanna get fired. So like off the field, he might be more respectful in the way of like how he behaves and how he manages you. But when it comes to the game, you have to understand that college coaches have pressure to win. They're not caring about your player or your son feeling. So I'm not saying that like coaches at this level have the same premise at youth or grassroots, but like, again, if your kid is saying, I want to go be a division one college player or be a professional, they have to start learning now. And it doesn't have to be the full thing yet, but throughout the years, learning that getting to the next level, one is very hard Two, nothing is given. It's all earned. And three, you actually have to be good. Now, obviously there's perception in all this, like a coach has to perceive that you're good. Like there's the factual, like the what is versus the interpretation, the, the, the perception. So the what is, is the coach has to pick 30 players, 40 players for his roster. He might not think you're of value, but the fact is he needs 40 players or whatever number he's looking for. Okay. But the other side of the coin would be that 
you know, he's going to pick players based on his perception of what he thinks he needs or positionally or whatever, whatever it is. You may not fit that bill. That's okay. It's not fair, but you have to understand that that is literally a part of the business. And if, you know, I'm calling this the developing a 1% player, and this is the framework of how to do so. If a player is going to be able to do that, then they have to be developed to a certain point that they can actually be successful in doing so. Otherwise, they're never going to get there. And I hope that makes sense because, you know, again, if we look at the next level, they have certain measurements and certain ways of behavior and the certain ways that they operate. Well, kids in youth soccer are not being put to that threshold or that standard or that measurement. You can basically do whatever you want to get away with it because you're paying for it as a parent. And unfortunately, there's not a lot of people that I feel like are like myself that truly care about helping kids get to the next level. But then like I'm dealing with these battles every single day and I'm extremely frustrated because it's like I've been to the next level. Okay, yes, I did not play in the Premier League. I did not play in La Liga, but I've gotten close. I've played semi-professionally. I played on the U.S. national team for futsal. I know what the next level looks like and I know what the academy system looks like. Like I have guys that are friends of mine that are at the next level and I talk with them all the time. I've, I've visited them. So yes, I didn't make, make it as a player per se, but I know what the environment looks like and it's not rainbows and cupcakes. It's do what I say or not and you're gonna be removed and you don't fit the bill and you're gonna be sold, you're gonna be released, or you're gonna be whatever, transfer, whatever word. And, and that's how ruthless it is. And I, I don't think people quite get that because in this country, it's not ruthless. People are paying, clubs want to make money, they want to maximize their revenue. Like, here's the thing, I'm going to tell you this story, it's kind of separate, but it all ties together. Like, you guys know this, or you may know this, you may not. I fit all three roles. I own, I direct, and I coach. I do all three, so I'm an owner of my own organization, I'm a director of my own organization, and I'm a coach. So like, I know what we need to do to pay our bills and to be successful in the business sense. I know what we need from a director standpoint. So because the owner is going to tell the director, so I'm, I'm wearing three hats. The owner is going to tell the director, hey, you need to make sure that you have as many kids as possible to make sure that we have enough money coming in to cover our costs, one. But two, you are, we're making money. Like obviously their businesses, they want to make money, right? Point blank, straightforward. And then three, what do you think the director is going to tell a coach? Hey guys, Maximize your rosters, maximize your rosters, and do whatever you need to do to win to make the average parent happy. Like this is the exact conversation that happens every single day between the three. Like I, our organization is different in that sense. Like I'm the owner. I wanna see kids being developed. So I tell the message to the director, I'm the director. So the director goes, okay, we wanna develop better players. We still have to pay our bills and we don't wanna be losing money every single year. We wanna be profitable to a certain extent, not to be a high profit, but we wanna be profitable. That way we can cover costs, we can have extra money in case something happens, we can cover expenses. If we need to buy something like a goal or we need to buy extra equipment, we can buy that. You know, you have to have money in the bank to do so. And then the director tells the coach, I'm one of the coaches as well, and I tell our staff, hey guys, we wanna develop better players. So like we have a blueprint, a formula, a framework. We need to focus on technical skill that focuses on Dribbling, receiving, passing, 1v1. Not in that order, I just gave you four of them. And then juggling touch, I call that touch, not just receiving. And we have to be developing those skills. And once we develop those skills, then we can work on other details. So that's the framework that we use to develop players and coaches. And that's not, but the point to that is, that's not what everybody else is doing. And I wanna recap that very quickly. So again, I fit all three roles, owner, director, coach, okay? So owners, to be quite honest, the average owner is not going to care about anything other than profit and margins. So are they revenue enough money to be profitable? And are they generating enough money to be profitable? Like those details, that's what they're going to be looking for. They're not going to care about a damn thing else. And then they're going to tell their directors underneath that, hey, maximize the number of players. It doesn't matter how we play. It doesn't matter what we do. It just matters that we have money coming in and that we can be successful. That's what it currently looks like in youth soccer. And then on top of that, what do you think the director's doing? He's going to his staff and he's saying, okay guys, these are your instructions. This is what we need. You need to maximize your rosters and you need to do what every parent, or I should say the average parent wants, which is win the game. Bar none, win the game, do whatever you need to do to win. So that means probably you're gonna be smashing the ball down the field. You're gonna be slamming it. 
because you need to win the game. And those are the exact conversations that are happening every single day from a boardroom to the director's meetings, to the, the, the directors, to the coaches, every single time and every single day. And that's why your kids are not getting better in the system because those are the conversations that are happening. It's maximizing revenue, it's maximizing profit, and it's making sure that these players are on the roster, paying their fees so they can pay their coaches, they can pay the directors, the owners maybe take a cut, and it's just about the dollar bills at the end of the day. It's not about the players. And that's what the model looks like in this country. And it's unfortunate, but that's how the business is.